All right, let's pray. God, we love you, and uh, Father, just continue to open up our ears and eyes to, to receive your word in our heart. And uh, Father, Lord, help me to be able to uh, share your word uh, in a way that glorifies you and that also helps us to understand, uh, Lord, what it looks like when it comes to anger. And Lord, the things in our life that maybe doesn't look like you, and, and Lord, how you do desire a better way. So Father, I pray right now that, Lord, you'd have your way with my speech, and you'd have your way with our hearts. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So I heard about this, uh, this lion that was really feeling good about himself, being the king of the jungle, right? So he decides to go walking through the jungle and just prove his point that he's the king of the jungle, you know, on this particular day. He's, he's feeling pretty good. So he decides to just bypass all of the, all the little animals, you know, and decides to go straight to the big ones. So he walks up uh, immediately to the bear. And he looks at the bear and he says, hey, bear, he said, who's the king of the jungle? And the bear looks at him and says, well, you are Mr. Lion. And he lets out this loud roar, you know, just feeling satisfied with that answer. And he walks on and he goes up to the tiger. And he says, hey, tiger, he said, who's the king of the jungle here? And the tiger says, well, you know what? Everybody in the jungle knows that you are Mr. Lion. And he roars again because he feels good about that. And then he walks up to the elephant. And he looks at the elephant. He said, hey, elephant. He said, who's the king of the jungle here? And the elephant just immediately reaches down with his trunk and grabs the... Uh, gra what is that beeping noise? He ends up grabbing the, uh, the uh, tiger or the lion. I've totally lost my joke. Now it's not even going to be good, does it? Wow. Man, there is like a really... Somebody go to the kitchen and get... or What is it? A connection. up with that it's broken it's broken all right you know what i'm not gonna lose my temper because that's what that's what we're talking about so this elephant he reaches down with his trunk and he picks up the lion and he swirls it around in the air three or four times and he slams it on the ground hits it up against the tree dumps it in the water and throws him back up on the beach and he looks at the lion and the lion kind of wobbles and he gets up to his feet and he's got these sad bloody eyes and he looks at the uh looks at the uh, the elephant and said man you didn't have to get so angry just because you didn't know the answer that honestly might have been better if I could have just flowed right on through with it. <laughs> but nevertheless, that's all right, right? Amen. So let me start off with asking you a couple questions and bring this to a serious note here. How many of you have gotten angry before? We've all gotten angry, haven't we? How many of you have gotten angry and thought and said and done things when you were angry that you wish you hadn't of? We've all done that, right? How many of you have uh, gotten angry and you said some things and you said some words and you've done some actions where maybe you thought that it wasn't really that big of a deal. Have you done that before and even blew it off thinking it wasn't that big of a deal? Guys, I believe if you're here today and you do believe it's a big deal and you do want to get rid of some anger issues, then I do believe that you came to the right place today because I believe that our scripture today, it deals with anger. And it deals with a way that we can do it in a different way than maybe we're what we're used to because I believe that God has a better way for us. Don't you agree with that? God's got a better way of doing things in our life because this is what the Sermon on the Mount's all about. You know, Jesus wants us to look at our lives, and he wants us to reevaluate our lives. He wants us to look at it and find the things that doesn't look like him. He wants us to take it to another level, and he wants to show us a different thought process than the way that we uh, usually live our life. He tells us that we, there's a better way that we can live than doing the things that we do. So you know what? If we truly want to look like disciples of Christ, if we're sitting here today and we say that, you know what, I'm a Christian... I'm a believer. And if somebody was to ask me that if I was a believer and I would say yes, I would ask you, does the world know that you're a believer based on your actions? Does the people around you know that you're a believer based on the way you handle things, the way you say things, the way you do things? Does the world around you, do you have to convince them that you're a disciple of Christ? If not, then I would say maybe there's some adjustments that we need to make in our life. Amen? I would say there's some things that we maybe need to do differently. And Jesus wants us to reevaluate our life in the Sermon on the Mount. Our scripture today is going to be in Matthew 5, 21 through 26. So if you uh, have your Bibles, open them up. If not, I've got uh, in the back of the bulletin there. And you can follow along with me as I read. And we'll see the adjustments, the adjustments we need to make in our life so the world knows who we belong to. Starting in verse 21, it says this. It says, You have heard it, and these are the words of Jesus. 
You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to court, or answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there, remember that your brother or sister has something against you to leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, and then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary, who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together uh, on the way, and your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last price. Penny, uh, the last penny. So if the world is going to know that we're Jesus' disciples, then the first thing that we need to do, the first thing that we need to recognize is on your outline, and it's Roman numeral number one, there's a danger in wrong anger. There is a danger in wrong anger. So here we go last week. Jesus is talking about your righteousness needs to surpass those of the, the scribes and the Pharisees. He's talking about that in 520. So he's given us these indications and he's talking to us about these things. And then Jesus goes from there right into getting into your business, right? He starts digging right into your business. How many of you like Jesus when he gets into your business? Can I tell you my life never changed until I let Jesus start getting in my business? Because see, as long as we kind of keep our life just claiming Christianity and we don't ever let Jesus get in our business, then nothing ever changes. And that's why our life looks the same. And that's why we don't look like disciples of Christ. Because we're doing our thing and the world doesn't see anything. So you know what I just want to offer you today? To let Jesus get in your business. Let him get in your business in this area and let him help you change the things so you can look differently. I want you to think about this for just a minute. You know, Jesus could have tackled anything in the world here. He could have just jumped in in any portion of his scriptures. He could have done anything in, in the world. But you know what he did? He jumps right into this portion and he talks about something that every single one of us struggle with from time to time. Every single one of us do. When I ask you if you've ever been angry before, the whole everyone in here raised up their hand. And if you didn't, you're a liar. <laughs> but everybody, everyone in here raised up their hand because we all struggle with anger. And Jesus said in verse 21, You have heard it said long ago that you shall not murder, and anyone that murders will be subject to anger, or subject to judgment. So when Jesus says, Hey, you've heard it said here, Jesus is getting ready to say something referring to the Old Testament because that's what he's talking about. He said, Hey, you've heard it said. So he's getting ready to refer back to the Old Testament because it's how they operated, it's how they functioned, it's how they lived. And he ends up quoting Exodus 20:13, which is one of the Ten Commandments. And this commandment says, You shall not murder. And then Jesus ends up reminding his listeners, the penalty of murder and he says you'll be subject to judgment so you know here at this time what's going on probably is when he quotes you heard it said you shall not murder I'm sure they're probably puffed up a little bit they're probably thinking well you know what this doesn't really apply to me right because I'm not you know they're probably most of the crowds thinking you know what I'm a good moral person I have good ethical uh, things you know I don't have a problem with murdering people so therefore I'm non guilty you know think about that for just a moment guys how much easier is it to set into a message when the preacher talks about something that doesn't apply to your life, right? Isn't that good? You know, because we can kind of sit there and think, yeah, I got this one down. Sure wish Bill and Susie was here, though, because they struggle in this area right now. How many times have you said in a message before and thought it didn't apply to your life? You know, I think all messages apply to our life if we just get down to the heart of the matter. So I'm thinking that this is probably what was going through some of their mind. And I'm thinking that this could be going through what is going through your mind too. You know what? I'm not a bad person. I've never killed anybody, right? I've never killed anybody. I've never murdered anybody. So this message really doesn't apply to me. However, Jesus comes on the scene here on the Sermon on the Mount. And what he tries to do is undo all their line of thinking. All their line of thinking, everything that they were thinking, he ends up taking and he drops this new way of thinking bomb on them. He gives them this new thought, something that they had not heard of. And what he does, he takes the sixth commandment, which is thou shalt not murder, and he presses it inward to the heart. That's what he does. He takes the sixth commandment, thou shalt not murder, and he presses it inward to the heart. Because the heart is where real change takes place. Amen? The heart is where real change takes takes place. So in verse 22, Jesus says this. He said, but I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister, so he's just talking about murder, 
And then he's saying, but I tell you, if anybody's angry with a brother or sister, will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. So now we need to remember that last week I said this. I said that Jesus came to fulfill the Old Testament, didn't I? I said he came to complete the Old Testament. He came to fulfill it. Everyone say fulfill. Jesus came to fulfill the Old Testament. I told you that Matthew 5, 17 through 20, which was our last week's message, I said that this is a hard message to preach because it's talking about a lot of the Old Testament. However, it's very, very important because it's kind of a hinge. It's kind of setting the groundwork for everything else that Jesus is getting ready to say. He's telling them last week that he is coming to complete, to fulfill the Old Testament, that it's not two different standards. It's, he's coming and getting to the heart of the problem and showing you what it really means. He came to fulfill it. So it is important that Jesus says here that he is not just only affirming the Old Testament, but he's also fulfilling it, meaning he is filling it in up to the full meaning. So in other words, it's, uh, in other words, what was implicit on the Old Testament law, Jesus makes explicit. He's clearing up things for us. And he's given us insight to God's original purpose, a purpose that had been lost among the teachers that day. They taught more about rules. They taught more about checklists. They taught more about all this and this. And Jesus ends up taking it, and he presses it inward to the heart. He gives it a different meaning. You know, he goes to the heart of the law to show the deepest meaning that this law was talking about. So by doing this, Jesus moves from the fruit of murder... That's what the original Old Testament law was talking about. That shall not murder. He's talking about the fruits, which is murder. And he ends up moving it to the root of murder. You know what the root of murder is? Wrong attitude. Anger. It all starts off there, right? So Jesus takes, goes from the fruit of the murder, and he takes it to the root, which is the heart. It's having the wrong heart. And he tries to show us that it's about the heart. If your heart's on the right place, guess what? You're not going to have a struggle. You're not going to struggle with murder, right? So in other words, in other words, Jesus is saying this to the crowd. He's saying, you know, all you people, all you people that you think you're keeping this commandment, when I'm talking about thou shalt not murder, all you people that think you're keeping this, what, what he's really saying is, you know what, this message that I'm getting ready to say, it does apply to you because you ain't keeping it like you think you is. That's what he's saying. You ain't keeping it like you think you is. Is that good English? It's my English. But that's what he's saying. Because you know what? We've all been angry with someone before, right? We've all been angry in word. We've all been angry in thought. We've all been angry in attitude. And we've all been angry in action. And when we have wrong anger, we are guilty of murder. That's what he's saying. If you have a wrong anger, you're just as guilty as murder. So in other words, you know what? God's not impressed with us if we refrain, refrain from murder. You know what God's more impressed with? If we refrain from wrong attitude. If we refrain from the wrong heart, if we refrain from anger, if we refrain saying things, doing things, and acting the way that we shouldn't, that's what God's more after because God deals with the heart. Amen? And in this verse, Jesus tells us that wrong, unrighteous anger is subject to God's judgment. Having the wrong anger in your life, having the wrong things, is subject to God's judgment. And in fact, he even goes on to say, we deserve the fires of hell. Do you read that in that scripture? He says it's deserving of the fires of hell. You know, as a believer, praise God, we're not subject to hell. Praise God that Jesus on the cross paid our sin debt. Praise God that we've been set free from that. However, this scripture shows us the seriousness of having the wrong heart. It has the seriousness of having the wrong attitude and doing things the wrong way. So now let's look. So now that we know it's the seriousness of this, let's quickly look at the insults. I want to talk about these two insults, these two examples that Jesus uses in this scripture here. So in verse 22, Jesus says this. He says, again, anyone who says to his brother or sister, Raka. Anybody ever wonder what Raka means? He says, for those of you uh, that call your brother or sister, says to your brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fires of hell. So the first insult, Raka here, it's actually an Aramaic term that means this. So when somebody said to their brother or sister, Raka, this is what it means. It means you're good for nothing. It means that you're worthless. It means that you're a brainless blockhead. It means that you're an empty-headed fool. It means you're an idiot. It means you're an imbecile. Do I need to keep going or do you guys get the idea? You get the idea. So when they used the term Raka, it wasn't a good thing, right? 
It wasn't a good thing. So similar to the same thing, uh, the word fool that they use here. How many of you have been told growing up that don't use the word fool because that's a bad word? You don't use the word fool? In fact, you go to hell if you call somebody a fool. Anybody ever hear that before? You know, they probably got that from this scripture. Being a fool, calling somebody a fool is not a good thing. Here's the deal, guys. The word fool is the Greek word for moros, which is where we get our word moron. The Greek word is moros, where we get the word moron. So in other words, in Jesus' day, the word fool or moros was used to describe a person's mental ability along with their moral character. It described their mental ability along with their moral character. So when they called somebody a fool, it was equivalent of saying that you're a stupid liar, or you're a stupid cheater, or you're a stupid infidel. It, again, it was an insult that was based on uh, calling somebody on their morals and their character. So you know what? We see right now the seriousness of these two words, right? The word raka and the word fool is two things that you don't call people. Raka attacks the intellect, while moros attacks the character. Now, for some of us right now today, you know what? It might not, be, it might not sound like that big of a deal to you. You know, the name calling, the this, it might not be that big of a deal because, you know, unfortunately, it's the world we live in. We live in a world by the majority of the people, the way they function, the way they operate. You know what? It, they just speak their mind. They say what's on their mind. They let it go, and we're used to it, right? We're hearing this kind of stuff. So this isn't that big of a deal to us. I mean, think about it. It's on the TV, isn't it? You can turn on any sitcom in the world, and they run each other down. They call each other names. The kids call the parents the names. The, the parents run the kids down. Look at all the TV dramas. Pick up the newspaper. Pick up a magazine. And they're constantly sharing the scoop on people, aren't they? And they're running people down. They're name-calling them. See, it's the world that we live in. Think about the, the political campaign ads that are going to come up. Do they name-call? Do they run each other down? Man, I can hardly wait for all those commercials again, can't you? Don't you get excited about that, that you're leaders of the country? Setting up there, slinging mud at each other. But see, this is the world that we live in. This is the world that we live in. So this might not be a big deal to you that, so what? So they call each other names and they run each down. But can I tell you that the time that this was written and the time that Jesus spoke these words in Jesus' day, this was a huge deal. This was an absolutely very huge deal because they lived in an honor and shame society because most people had very little to trade with except for their honor. So to run somebody down publicly was a very, very serious matter. They didn't take it lightly like we do. It was a very serious matter. And if a person was to lose their good reputation, it was the same as dying. You ever thought about if you lost your reputation? You know how devastating that would be? You know, it was devastating to them. It was the same as dying. So running them down and by calling them names, in effect, Jesus was saying this. He's saying you've already murdered them by character assassination. You've already murdered them by character assassination. So let me ask you a question. How many people have you assassinated with your words? How many people have you assassinated with your words? Probably more than you'd like to admit, amen? If we just got real with ourselves. Guys, this is a big deal. So let's take a look about what the Bible says concerning the people that we murder and assassinate every day with our thoughts and our actions. You know, in this passage, Jesus includes the phrase, brothers and sister, brother and sister. You know, most likely Jesus was referring to believers. That's most likely what he was referring to. However, isn't it sad how our anger seems the easiest to spew out all over the people that are closest to us and we love the most? Isn't that true? It's easy. It's a lot easier. How many of us can bite our tongues when it comes to people outside. Somebody makes me mad, oh, okay, I can bite my tongue. Some of you can't, <laughs> but some of us can. But let somebody that we love, let somebody close to us, and I don't know what gives us the right, but we just feel like, you know what, I can just spew it all over them, right? I can just let them know how I feel. I can just let it all come out, and I can let it go. I can let it rip, and I can do it. Am I the only one that's ever been guilty of that, or that, is that the way we operate? Just me? <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> but you know what? That's what we do. The ones that we love the most, we hurt the most. And guys, that should not be. Because you know what? We let our parents say something. We let our brother or sister say something. We let our children, our friends, we let somebody say something. And you know what? It's easier to blow up on it. Guys, here's the deal. Unrighteous anger is wrong no matter who it's towards. But we should really be more patient towards those we love the most. Don't you think? 
Don't you think we should be more patient with those that we love the most? Even though I'm not giving you the okay to have an unrighteous anger towards other people. Don't hear it that way. But however, usually the ones that we love the most, we hurt the most. Because you know why? We're comfortable. We're comfortable around them and we let our comfortableness be an excuse to say and act however we want. Guys, listen, there's a lot of scriptures in the Bible that deal with this. Just listen to a few here. In Colossians 3.19, Paul says this. He says, Husbands, love your wives and do not in, uh, be embittered against them. Love your wives and do not be embittered against them. You know, this is directed to the husbands, but however you wives are not off the hook. We could, we, put, we could put wives in that place too. We're not supposed to provoke each other and to push each other into bitterness. He says that we're supposed to do things differently. This can be both ways. We need to stop putting each other on a guilt trip, don't you think? Husbands and wife, quit run, putting each other on a guilt trip. Quit always finding faults on each other. Quit name calling, quit yelling, quit the sarcasm. Quit constantly blaming each other. Don't you think we got some room for improvement when it comes to spouses being husband? wife and relationships. Listen to what Peter says. Peter says in 1 Peter 3, 7, he says that if we don't treat our spouse with love and respect, that our prayers will be hindered. Woo! Our prayers will be hindered if we don't treat our spouse with love and respect. You want to know how come some of your prayers aren't getting answered? Because you've got a real cruddy relationship with your spouse right now and you're not treating each other with love and respect. I believe that. It's in God's Word. Amen? So maybe if we'd start treating the ones that we love with love and respect and doing things differently, maybe our prayers would look maybe a little bit differently. And then let's move on here to another relationship when it comes to parents and children. In Ephesians 6.4, Paul writes this, Fathers, and you can put in mothers as well, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So what about it, mom and dad? Are you constantly running down your children? Are you constantly riding them all the time? Are you constantly provoking them? Are you constantly pushing them away because this and this and this has got to be this way and you're just shoving them farther and farther and creating an atmosphere that is creating hostility into your life? Now, I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that we need to discipline our children. I believe that. I'm a firm believer in that. If you don't discipline, you're creating an environment to spoil them, and they're going to rebel anyway. So I believe in discipline the right way. However, our discipline should be completely, our home should be saturated with love and compassion for our kids. So how about that? But you know what, kids? You're not off the hook. You're not off the hook at all. Because you know what the Bible says? Children are supposed to honor their father and mother. So you know what? Lose your bad attitude. Lose your bad attitude, quit constantly wanting to fight, quit trying to be hard to get along with, and just start getting along. Amen? Don't you think that'd be such a beautiful environment at the home? Don't you think it would be more peaceful if husbands and wives started loving and respecting one another? Don't you think it'd be a lot better environment if, if parents are, are loving their children with compassion and love and discipline like they should while the, parent, or the kids are looking to their parents and loving them and honoring them and respecting them? Don't it seem like a beautiful picture of what God wants in a home? See, I believe that if we give it to God, then our lives will change because he's got a better way. Guys, the next time you want to get angry and speak your mind with your spouse, your children, your parents, a fellow believer, you know, don't be deceived in thinking it's not a big deal. Don't be deceived in thinking it's not a big deal because unrighteous anger, I can tell you it is a very big deal and it will absolutely destroy your relationship. It will destroy your relationship. Guys, you know what might happen? You might win the battle, but you're going to lose the war. Amen? What's more important to you? You know, we need to change some things when it comes to anger, when it comes to our thoughts. Now, I'm going to give you just a few thoughts because I want to help you in this area. I'm going to give you a few thoughts when it comes to controlling the wrong anger in your life. But I first want to clarify just a couple quick things. Guys, not all anger is sin. Not all anger is sin. There is a very righteous anger. And in fact, when you read the pages of Scripture, even Jesus showed a righteous anger when he went into the temple. When they were destroying the temple by setting up the money changers, he drove them out. He flipped the tables over, drove them out with a whip. So there is a righteous anger. But the Bible says in the midst of his anger, he did not sin. 
He did not sin. So you know what? We should have a righteous anger when it comes to sin in, 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 in this world. We should have a righteous anger when it comes to abortionists, when it comes to drug pushers, when it comes to pornographers, racists, child abusers, terrorists, corrupt leaders, and so on and so on. But guys, here's the deal. Unfortunately, the majority of Christians don't struggle with righteous anger. We usually struggle with unrighteous anger. Amen? I'm going to repeat that again. Unfortunately, the majority of the Christians don't struggle with righteous anger. We usually struggle with unrighteous anger. Amen? Let's get that part right in our life. So here's a few thoughts that's going to help you. I, I hope will help you when it comes to controlling your anger problem. Number one, number one, if you're going to control your anger, you need to admit you have a problem. You need to admit you have a problem. I've said several, several times in this message... I'll trip on that probably. Several, several times uh, throughout different messages, if you don't admit you have a problem, you can't fix it, can you? See, so many of us, we never want to admit we have a problem. We're okay with it. And you know what? We're just going to do whatever it is that we want to do, and we just always make excuses. Guys, can I tell you, quit making excuses for yourself. If you know you've got some anger issues, then admit it. Admit you have some anger issues. Quit making excuses. Quit always trying to pass the buck off for blaming somebody else for your outburst. This is what I tell people. You want to change your life? Then you need to get your butt out of the way. Everybody keeps putting their butt in the way. When I say that, B-U-T. B-U-T. You know, I wouldn't have acted that way, but they did this. I shouldn't have acted that way, but they did this. See, we keep passing the buck, right? We need to quit doing that. Who cares about the butt? Just admit, you know what? I got a problem. Yes, I have an anger problem. And yes, I want to fix it. I don't want to keep going down this road route, route again. Quit always trying to pass it off on somebody else. Can I tell you, the person that is ticking you off, the person that is ticking you off doesn't have any more control over your life than you let them have. The person that is ticking you off has no more control over your life than you allow them to have. Quit making excuses. Quit passing the buck. Quit blaming it on somebody else. Get past it. Just take ownership in it. Just admit you have a problem because you know what? When you admit to it, you know what happens? You want to confess it before God. And when you confess it before God, when you admit it and you say, God, I have a problem. I need your help in this area. You know what's going to happen? God's going to say, now we can do business. Now we can do business. Now I can get inside your heart and I can start rearranging things. I can start getting in your business. I can start changing some things and I can start making you look more like me from the inside out. And that's what it's all about, right? But that doesn't happen until we first admit that we have a problem. You know, I had a very, very hot temper and so did Rhonda, especially when we came to the Lord 15 years ago. But can I tell you that one of the first uh, scriptures that I memorized was James 1.19. Write that down and memorize that. You know what James 1.19 says? It, be, it says, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. You know how amazing that scripture is? Be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. You need to write that scripture down if you struggle in this area. And you know what you need to do? You need to put it on a post-it. You need to put it on your bathroom mirror so you can read it first when you get up. You need to put it on the dash of your car so you can read it on the way to work. You need to put it on your computer screen at work or whatever it is that you do for a living. You need that verse all over the place plastered so you you can remember it. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. And so that means when somebody's touching your buttons, when somebody's pushing you, you know what you're going to do? You're automatically going to go to that. So admit you have a problem. Admit you have a problem so God can begin to work in your life, guys. It's not going to happen until then. And the next, second thing that you need to do is know that there are consequences to your outbursts. Know that there's consequences to your outbursts. See, we've been told, you know, the old nursery rhyme, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Guys, that's a lie. That's an absolutely lie. You know, words will hurt you. They will hurt you. They will cut you down. Those that you're up against, they will cut you down. That is a lie. David even exposes this lie in Psalm 52 too. And this is what he says. David says, you who practice deceit, your tongue plots destruction. It's like a sharpened razor. Like a sharpened razor. So David's saying you need to watch out. Your tongue's like a razor. You're going to cut people off and you're going to cut people down with your words. Listen, guys, when you get angry and lash out the words, I hate you. I want a divorce. I'm sick of you. Marrying you was a mistake. I wish you'd never been born. I can't stand you. You're fat. You're ugly. You're worthless. You're stupid. You make me sick. You're such a... 
You know what the saddest thing is? When these words leave your lips, you can't get them back. You can't get them back. It doesn't matter how much you try to go after them, you can't get them back. They've already been heard, they've already went into the other person's heart, and now they've got to figure out how they're going to deal with it from here. You can't get it back. You know what the better way of doing it is? Don't let it leave your mouth. Don't let it leave your mouth. If you would just be quick to listen for a second, and you would think about your words, and you would think about the consequences of your words, if I say this, what kind of ramifications am I going to have? What's going to happen after this? How are they going to hand be handled by the person that hears it? If I think about the consequences and I realize that marriages are destroyed, families are divided, kids leave home and never come back, relationships end and churches split, guys, can I tell you, if you would think about the consequences before you say and act and do the things that you do, it should change the things that you say, don't you think? But see, we usually say it right off the cuff before we even think about it. But if we've memorized James 1.19, then we won't have a problem in that area because we'll be thinking about it a little bit more. Guys, Jesus even tells us in Matthew 12.36, he says that every single word that we speak, we're going to give an account for. All of our careless words, how do you want to stand before Jesus one day? Do you want to stand before with all these words and give an account the way we've done? The best thing to do is to not even let them leave our lips. So to overcome the anger issues, we need to admit we have a problem. We need to know there's consequences for our outbursts. And number three, this is one of the most freeing things, if you can get this, I believe in this. Number three is expect someone to push your buttons. Amen? Expect someone to push your buttons. I'm not going down the negative highway here, okay? I'm not trying to give you the, blue, uh, the gloom and doom here. But unless you haven't realized it, we're not perfect. You're not perfect. We live in a very non-perfect world. We live with non-perfect people all around us. So I'm thinking with all the non-perfectness, someone somehow, some way, absolutely, positively will push your buttons before the day's over, even the ones that you love the most. Amen? Guys, when you get up in the morning and you feel like that I've got to control my day and it's got to go just like this, that means my spouse needs to greet me like this. That means my kids need to do this. That means when I get to work, my employees, my boss, everybody that I come in contact with, everybody needs to treat me like this. We get this in our mind and then when things don't go our way, we blow it. Don't we? We blow our top because we're mad because nothing went our way. We end up saying things, doing things that we should not do. But guys, if you just know and expect that somebody throughout the day is going to push your buttons, so Lord, help me be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Help me to live that way. Help me to know that once I come across something, what I say, how I act, is going to be consequences to it. Do you think if we put those three things in your life, do you think it would change things? Do you think it would change things? I think it would. I think it would. God even convicted me this week of the things that I need to do differently uh, in, in the way that I treat people and the way that I do. Guys, listen, here's the point. We need to lighten up and live. Quit letting everything and everyone get on your nerves. There's not always going to go your way. People are going to say things, do things that they shouldn't have. So you know what? We just need to expect this and we need to be prayed up. We need to be prayed up uh, so God will give us grace and mercy to deal with people. Don't you think that's a better way to live? Don't that seem like a lot more peaceful way to live? Man, I'm telling you, listening to people's... Oh, I'm wore out sometimes just listening to that. I want peace. I want peace in my life. I want peace in my work environment. I want peace. And I'm not going to let anybody mess up my peace. I don't want them to steal it. It has everything to do with the way we handle it. So guys, here's the deal though. We're not perfect. We're not perfect, so that means that we are going to mess up, and I promise you we will. So it's important when we do mess up, Roman numeral number two, is we need to get right with those that we wronged. We need to get right with those you wrong. So let's change gear for just a few minutes in our remaining time here. You know, Jesus goes from warning us not to get angry to telling us, you know what, if we do make somebody angry because of something that we did wrong, we need to go get right. Right? We need to go get right with that person, and we don't need to put it off. So in this scripture, we see two illustrations exposing the seriousness of anger and dealing with it. The first illustration pertains to, wor to a worship contents, or context, and the second pertaining to a legal system or legal setting. So let's take a look at the first one real quick. In verses 23 to 24, Jesus said this. He said, Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, have your gift, uh, leave your gift at the altar 
and then go first and be reconciled to them and then come back and offer your gift. So in this scripture here, we can see that reconciliation takes priority over worship, right? Takes place over worship because he said, leave your gift. Go get it right. He's telling us that it's very, very important. Guys, listen up. If you really want to worship me is what Jesus is saying, he's saying then go get right with the people that you wronged. If you really want to worship me, then go get right with those that you wronged. He even goes on to say that reconciliation is not important enough to interrupt worship. This is a beautiful reminder of how important it is for Jesus and his followers to have harmonious relationships. You want to look like Christ? You want to represent Christ to the world? Have harmonious relationships. You know, get it right. Jesus says there's a very, very importance on this. So let's break this down just a little bit so you can understand this just a little bit more here, what's going on. When Jesus uses the expression of leaving your gift at the altar to go reconcile, he's talking about the animal sacrifices that they would take to the Jerusalem temple, the temple in Jerusalem. So now you might be sitting here today going, okay, well, what's the big deal about that? Okay, so he said, you know, leave your offering. You know, yeah, they take an animal sacrifice to Jerusalem. What's the big deal about that? I'll tell you what the big deal, and the crowd that Jesus is talking to recognizes this and understands this. The crowd he's talking to, he's in Galilee. Okay? So Galilee is an 80 mile, 80 mile trip to Jerusalem to where the temple is, to where they offer the animal sacrifices that they would have to journey to, to Jerusalem to the temple. Okay? So Guess how long it took them to make an 80-mile trip? Because, see, they didn't have cars like us. They didn't have SUVs where they could just take off and jump in. It took them a week long to make that trip. So this is what Jesus is saying. When it comes time for you to make your sacrifice, when it comes, come, times come, comes time for you, I'll get this right, to go make that sacrifice, and he said, you're going to leave Galilee, you're going to take your animal, and then he said, when you get to the temple, and he said, 80 miles a week later, and you get ready to go offer that, if God shows you that you've done something wrong to somebody else, then you need to leave that animal sacrifice, you need to leave the altar, and you need to make that 80 mile week long trip back to Galilee, make things right, and then after you make things right, then you can go 80 mile trip week long all the way back to the Jerusalem temple. You can make that sacrifice, then you can take the week long 80 mile trip all the way back home. Man, I'm wore out. If you did the math on that, that's 320 miles and that's a month to make that happen. So you know, that's Jesus saying... We need to go out of our way to make things right. Wouldn't you agree? Wouldn't you agree that there's an importance on trying to make things right? Guys, the illustration here gives a, a distinction, two uh, important distinctions. He says, if your brother or sister has something against you, you know what? That tells me a couple of things. That tells me that one, their beef against you is probably legit. That means you probably have done something that you shouldn't have. That means that you probably said something that you shouldn't have. That means they have a legit reason to be mad at you. And the second thing I want us to see here is that they said, if they have something against you, not if you have something against them. If they have something against you, not if you have something against them. You know why Jesus said that? Because if you have the problem, dude, you need to let it go. You need to let it go. Let it go. Quit trying to harbor on to unforgiveness. Quit holding on to all that junk. Quit trying to just control the situation. We need to finally just let it go. Don't you agree? Guess who unforgiveness hurts? It forgets you. It hurts you. But we just hold on to that. You know what? We need to let it go. Quit having issues with so many people. Overlook some things. Even Proverbs 19.11 says this. It says a man's discretion makes him slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook a transgression. Guys, if we don't, it'll lead away at you and it'll destroy you. Jesus is saying this. Week after week, this is the picture he's given here. Week after week, people come into worship. Just like you, just like you are today. People come into worship. They hear sermon after sermon. They come in on Wednesday night. They have Bible studies. They eat together. We pray together. We take offering together. We give offering together. We take communion together. We do all this stuff together, all while we're harboring unforgiveness in our heart. And that can't, that can't happen. We've got to let it go. Jesus said true worship depends on the worshipers who seek to be reconciled to each other. You know what? If you've wronged somebody... You need to get it right. So let's quickly look at the second illustration as we come close to closing here. We see here again that Jesus gives us a sense of urgency when it comes to making things right. This time it's most likely geared toward people outside the church. In verse 25, 26, he says this, Settle your matters quickly 
with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on your way, and your adversary may hand you over. Or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and they may throw you into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. You know, this illustration assumes that you owe an accuser, uh, a, that you owe a debt, and that he's coming to collect it from you. You know, Jesus is basically saying, you know what? Try not to go to court. You know what? If you can work matters out before going there, before it goes too far, if you owe somebody something, pay it back. Do whatever it takes to make things right with the people in your life, whether it's family, whether it's people you work with, whether it's the outside world. He's just saying that anger is a problem, and it creates so many different circumstances, and we need to get things right. I'm going to ask the praise team to come on up as we close. Guys, listen to this. Both these examples seem to indicate that Jesus expects us to experience conflict. He expects us to experience conflict. So the point is this, not so much to eliminate conflict, but it's to resolve it. It's to resolve it as soon as it happens. Don't put it off. Don't wait. Conflict is inevitable. However, our focus should always be on resolution. Our focus should always be on resolution. Now, maybe you're thinking right now, you know what? I've tried to reconcile, but you know what? Some people are very unwilling. I've tried to go to them. I've tried to make points to them. I've tried to tell them I'm sorry. I've tried to ask for forgiveness. And they've been very, very unacceptive. And they're not, they're not treating you the way that you want them to. They're not forgiving you like you wish. Can I tell you that Romans 12, 18 says this. The Apostle Paul says, As much as it depends upon you to be at peace with all men. Guys, listen. As long as you're going into it with the right heart, as long as you are honestly trying to make things right and you're going in with a very humble attitude and they don't receive it, Guys, you can't make them. You know, I got a couple of strained relationships right here in this town. I've tried to go make things right. I've tried to reconcile. I've tried to get things on the right page. I've tried to do it in the right, and they've been completely unreceptive. Hands up. Don't want to have anything to do with me. You know what? I'm going with the right heart. I finally had to chalk it up, as you know what? I've done all I can. And if they come, I'll welcome with open arms. I'll never hold anything against them. But you know what? As long as you try to do the right thing and they are unreceptive, that's all you can do. You can't change somebody, right? You can't make them forgive you. You can't make them go on. But that doesn't stop you from doing the right thing. You need to go and you need to make things right so we can resolve the conflict that we have in our life. Don't let things come up in your life that keeps you angry and keeps you bitter. So let me leave you with this question. Is there anyone in your life right now that you need to seek reconciliation with so you can experience peace? Do you have anyone in your life right now that you need to seek reconciliation with so you can experience peace? Could it be your in-laws? Could it be your ex? Could it be your parents? Could it be your spouse? Your coworker? Your neighbor? Your friend? Could it be your children? Can I get real with you just, just a minute? You guys like being real? Let me get real with you for just a minute. You know, probably a month ago, I woke up, must have been in a bad mood. I wasn't applying these things in my life that I just told you to. Well, my middle child, Gracie, she's kind of hard-headed sometimes. She comes by it natural from Rhonda and I both. She gets up and she must not be experiencing a good day either. And we were just like sandpaper, it seemed like. It seemed like nothing was going right. It seems like there just was that hostility there between us. And as I was taking her to school, we ended up arguing. We ended up arguing and I tell you what, I blew it. I blew my top. I lost my temper. Man, I felt like a hypocrite. I felt like a hypocrite. I felt like a poor excuse for a father. I drop her off and we barely mumble the words, I love you. <laughs> then I park out here at the church. So I can come in and prepare a message and help people with their problems. All I look like the biggest hypocrite of all. And God says, you know what? Before you can help anybody else with your problems, you better get your own problems right. And I don't care if it takes you a month and 320 miles to make it right. You better make it right. So I called Rhonda and I said, hey, what time does Gracie go to lunch at school? And she told me. So I went to the school. I just went into the office. I said, I'm taking my daughter out of school. I'll bring her back. They didn't ask why. So all you teachers, plug your ears. Actually, I don't even care. 
So I took my daughter out, and here Gracie is. She's coming walking down the hall, and she's looking at me like, what are you doing? And I don't even say a word. I just take her right outside, and as we're walking to the car, I said, Gracie, I love you. I love you, and I am so sorry. I blew it. I blew it, and I'm sorry. And I said, you know what? I don't want you to eat that cafeteria lunch today. I'm going to take you to your favorite place. Where do you want to go eat? She said, Taco Bell. <laughs> So we went to Taco Bell, and we ate, we loved on each other, we laughed, gave her a kiss, and I took her back to school, and I told her how much I love her. Guys, don't put reconciliation off. I'm not perfect by any means. I fall short all the time, but I don't want to have anger in my life. I don't want to be filled with anger, and if I've done wrong, man, I want to make it right, even if it's with my kids. Whoever it's with, I want to make it right. So let me leave you with this thought. If you were going to see Jesus today and you had one phone call to make to tell somebody you're sorry, who would you call? Who would you call? What are you waiting for? Make that phone call today. Make things right. Let's stand at our feet. Bow your head and close your eyes. I want to ask you this question. Guys, you cannot even experience freedom from that until you first know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So I'm going to ask you, do you know Jesus? If you don't, raise up your hand and say, Pastor, that's me. I want to know Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I want to commit my life to Him. Would you raise up your hand right now? I just want to pray for you. Would you do that? Pastor, that's me. I want to know Jesus as my Savior. Father God, we come before you today in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we love you. And God, I pray that we would understand and we would recognize that anger is so wrong. So wrong. Lord, I thank you that your word cuts right to the heart. Shows us the things that we need to do differently. Lord, help us to get rid of all that. Help us, Lord, if we need to reconcile some relationships, that we would take that step and that we would do that and that we would trust you, Jesus, all the way through it and glorify you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.